that Jesus needed Peter's boat, but that Peter needed Jesus' blessing on his boat. We need to reconnect back to the source because as we reconnect back to the source, as we reignite our desire, as we step back into what God is asking us to do, as we allow his word to wash over our heart, as we allow this idea of who he is and what he says to become or to, to re-become our reality, what happens is, is his blessing, his glory begins to pour out of our life. So the, the last few messages that I preached, I titled them, uh, the first one I preached was Recalibrate, the second one I preached was Reset, and uh, this morning the title of my message is Reconnect, um, because I believe in, you know, the Lord told me to title it that, and I'm, you know, kind of like, do I want to name it that or not, because sometimes the idea of reconnecting makes us feel like we aren't connected, yeah. right? Although, hey, how many of you would say, I'm connected, I'm pretty connected, right? But one of the things that I noticed was I actually just got the Apple EarPods, Okay, and they're awesome. If you think you know, get them. I recommend them. They're amazing. Uh, but one of the things I notice is sometimes the connection gets a little bad. Like they're working, but they're not working as good as I know they could work. And so what I do is I unpair them and I reconnect, right? Not because they weren't already connected, but because I know there can be a better connection that's going to get me a better result. Amen. And I would say that 2018, in my life at least, that I'm looking for a better result than what I had in 2017. 2017 was pretty good, but 2018 I'm believing is gonna be pressed down, shaken together, running over in my life, and I believe that for you as well, amen. You can say amen, it's okay, right? There we go, thank you. You know, the more that you amen me, the better I preach, and so if you wanna like get a better preaching, just amen me a bit, makes me feel good about myself. Um, amen, thank you, Dad. Uh, I don't know if that was an amen because he's hoping that I preach better than I did last time, or what, we'll see. Uh, but this morning, uh, obviously, and I'm sure that you know, based off of this house and where we are, that when I talk about the fact of reconnecting, really what I'm going to talk about this morning is the message of faith. Because the way that we, we, we connect to God is through our faith, right? God is not moving. He's unchanging. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. 2,000 years ago, he did everything he was going to do. Every blessing that he desires to pour out in 2018, he already accomplished and poured those things out 2,000 years ago, right? And so the way that I connect to the blessing of God isn't that I do something really well. It isn't that I perform to a certain level, and now that I've performed to this level, now I've reached the place where I qualify for the blessing of God. That's not what I'm talking about this morning. We're talking about faith because we want to connect to the fact that we believe that 2,000 years ago, Jesus did all the things that he said he was going to do. And when I connect in my belief to the fact that 2,000 years ago, he did everything he was going to do, now I'm able to become a recipient of that thing. Amen? Amen. And so, uh, and the reality is, is that the scripture says that when Jesus comes back, what he's doing is he's looking for a people who have faith. To Jesus, faith is the most important thing, right? And so, I mean, sometimes you probably, some, I feel like, you know, we can have another faith message, Lord. Like, let me preach something else. And he reminds me, no, when I come back, I'm looking for faith. That faith is our most valuable commodity, it is the way that we do business. The way that I take something from the spirit realm into the natural realm is that I access that thing by faith. And so faith is how we access the blessing of God in our life. Write this down. Grace is the means, but faith is the way. Grace is the means, faith is the way. The scripture says it like this, that by grace we are saved. Grace is what did the work. Jesus, who is grace, he did the work. He was the one that made the miracle possible, but it says by grace through faith. The way that I access the promise that grace provided is that I access it through the faith that I believe that God does it, right? Faith doesn't get God's hand to move because he's already moved. What faith does is faith connects me to the grace of God, which is the blessing manifested in my life. Could you say amen to that? Yes. So remember, this is not a message of performance. This isn't a message where I'm telling you to do better and God will bless you. It has nothing to do with that. This is a message that says it's challenging us to believe God at a new level. Yes, and the more that I believe him, the more that I can see and experience in my life, right? Because this is the reality is the way that I see the blessing, right? Finances, relationship, peace, joy. The way that I see those things is through faith. Amen? Okay, so this morning I want to take some time. We're going to read uh, the scripture. It's a very familiar passage of scripture. Um, I think that the first time I heard it was probably when I was like four years old in vacation Bible school. Could have very potentially been Brad and Donna over there. Thank you for... <laughs> Yes, thank you for that. Um, 
I grew up with them, and uh, they probably were the first ones to introduce me to this. Uh, so we're going to read Luke 5, and we're going to go from 1 to 11. We may not read all the way to 11 right now, but that's where we're going today. Uh, it's going to pop up on the screen. I'm actually reading out of the New International Version, um, and they're probably going to put the New King James on there. So maybe a little bit different, but you can still follow along. It says, As one day as Jesus was standing at the lake of Gennesaret, yes. the people who were— Yes, Mike was there. <laughs> yes, let's give it up for Mike as well. Yes, welcome back, Mike. Okay. Everybody's getting praised. Just the more that you say, the more that we will clap for you, right? So just interrupt me, and I will be like, yes, let's clap for Garth, because he looks great in that purple shirt. Yeah, woo! All right. Okay. So it says this, the people who were crowding around him and listening to the word of God, when he saw the water's edge, two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into the boats of the one who was belonging to Simon, who later we would call Peter, because one of the things that I think is so amazing is this, is that Jesus can so change who we are that even what people call us changes. Yeah. You might be sitting here this morning feeling like there's no way that I could, there's no way that I could, but Jesus, when we let him in, he can so change us that those people who said that you were a failure, you were never going to amount to anything, you can never, they're going to be forced when they see Jesus in you, they're going to be forced to change what they call you. And so it says this, that, uh, so he got into the boat belonging to Simon and asked, and asked him to put out a little from the shore. And then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep waters and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered, I can imagine, with an attitude, right? Master, we worked hard all night and we caught, haven't caught anything. You know, Jesus, your talk was good, but we're professionals, Right? <laughs> You do the preaching, and we'll do the fishing, right? Um, and so we see this, and it says that, and then how many of you are so thankful that the next word in that is but, right? I'm sure that Peter in heaven is so thankful for the but that comes next. Because let me tell you something. God can bless your obedience. Oh, this is good. God can bless your obedience even when you do it with a bad attitude. You know, you don't have to want to go to the gym in order for your body to respond to the workout, right? You know what? You don't even have to have wanted to, let me ask you this, how many of you didn't want to come to church this morning, right? But I tell you something, I tell you something, you might not have wanted to come, but the people who come, even when they don't want to, you're going to get the biggest blessing. Why? Because Jess said it this morning. It's the sacrifice of praise that when I don't want to do something and I do it anyways, because I believe God, what it's, creates an environment for the miraculous to happen. Okay. So it says this, he got into the boat and he said, but because you say so, I will let down the nets. And when they had done so, they caught a large number of fish that the nets began to break. We'll stop there for now. Let's just pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this morning and everything that you're doing. Lord, that you're stirring our hearts to believe in the impossible. God, that you are doing the impossible in our lives. Things that people have told us could never happen 2018 is the year where you make impossible possible. Yes. We thank you for it, Lord. We thank you for your anointing this morning that it would come and it would shift our hearts and change us in Jesus' name. Yes. Amen. Turn to your neighbor and say this. Neighbor, neighbor. you're on the edge of a blessing. Yes. Turn to your other neighbor and say, neighbor. neighbor. Say this. Say, favorite neighbor. Favorite. You're on the edge of a blessing. So it's time to reconnect. Because what we're going to talk about this morning is this, that the edge of our next blessing is often the place of our greatest frustration. And we see this in the life of Peter, right? Where, where we, we read this example and we see him here that, that it was after Peter had fished all night long and caught nothing. Now, fishing wasn't his hobby, right? Like if Paul goes fishing and he catches nothing, it's no big deal because he's not sell. I mean, maybe it is a big deal to you, Paul, but it's not a big deal because he's not selling the fish. Peter, in this example, this was how he, exp how he uh, produced his livelihood. This was how he made money. And so this was a very frustrating moment for him because he went and worked all night long and he produced nothing. But, right, just when he was ready to call it a day, just as he was, the scripture says, washing his nets, just as he was putting the boats up on the dock, right? Here comes this radical rabbi, Jesus, 
with the big crowds, right? I mean, everywhere Jesus went was standing room only. You know, I heard a preacher say he pastors a big church, and he says that if you don't like big churches, then you probably won't like heaven, right? Because, I mean, everywhere Jesus goes, he draws a crowd, right? And so this is what's happening here, and, and, and he's experiencing and intimately acquainted with this moment. And the very first point that I want to talk about this morning is this point of conditional miracles, that there are conditions that, are, that we create and there are conditions of things that happen in our lives that cause us or, or that cause our surroundings to be right and ripe for a miracle, right? Because so often we see in scriptures this very, this very uh, you know, it's the same point, literally I feel like everywhere throughout scriptures, that God reserves his greatest glory for our lowest moments, right? I mean, over and over in scripture, we see this, right? That after he has fished all night, right? I mean, don't we see it, right? That it was after he had been thrown in the lion's den, right? After they turned the furnace up seven times hotter, right? After he had been, you know, had a spear chucked at him, God now steps in and does something. And, you know, sometimes I challenge this because God isn't waiting for us, right, to be like down in the depths. And that is like, yes, I'm going to move. He always wants to move. But I think the reality of what happens to us is that at these low moments, when we no longer have any options, when there's no longer anything that we can do in our own strength, now the condition is right for God to step in and do something in our lives. That it's like we have this moment where we come to the end of ourselves and God finds that moment and sees that moment and he steps in and he says, I'll take it from here. And so we see this over and over and over again and I think that this is the reality is that, you know, we should learn to come to it a little bit quicker to realize that the faster we can run out of options, the faster we can stop trying to hold on to this thing in control, the faster we can stop trying to make things work out and figure things out, the quicker we allow God to step in and do and move and, and be the God that we so desperately desire him to be in our life. And so Mike was there, right? He was, like we said, he was just there at the Sea of Galilee. Um, the, the, it's called in the NIV the Lake of Gennesaret, but it's actually, you know, the Sea of Galilee, the Lake of Gennesaret, they're actually the same thing. And I was, when he was there, I was looking up because I was interested slash a little jealous that he was there. Um, and so I wanted to know what he was doing so that I knew uh, purposefully what to be jealous of as I heard what he was doing. Um, and then I realized that uh, the, it's more, it, you should actually call it the Lake of Gennesaret, not the Sea of Galilee, right? Because the Sea of Galilee makes it feel like it's the Sea of Galilee. Like it's, but it's actually, it's better to call it a lake. You know, um, but the interesting thing that I find about the, that I've discovered about as I was doing a little bit of research about it is that the Lake of Gennesaret, the Sea of Galilee, is actually the lowest freshwater lake on the earth. It's the second lowest, like uh, basically the second lowest place. The, the lowest is the Dead Sea. Then the one right up from that is the Lake of Gennesaret. It's the lowest freshwater body of water, which is very interesting. Um, and it was the birthplace of Jesus, and it was very significant in his ministry. It was actually the place where he did 50% of his miracles was around this area, this low point. And as I began to think about it, I began to ask myself if there was a significance behind why Jesus chose this to be the point where he did so many of his amazing things. Why it was this place that he chose it to be kind of the epicenter, the birthplace of the glory that he was about to flow in in his ministry. And I asked myself, and of course, you know, I'm of the persuasion that he does nothing by accident. Um, and so I began to ask myself, did Jesus choose this point, the lowest point, because it was the closest to him? Or is it and this is what I think it is, is that so often is that God chooses the low places in our life, our weakest moments in our path to display his greatest glory and his miracles in our life. And so, you know, this isn't for everybody, right? Because there's some people here, maybe here, maybe out there that you know, that are doing just fine, right? Like they got money, they got stuff, you know, they got the cars, they got the girls, right? They got it all. But I want to sit here this morning and say, maybe there's just one or two of you in this place right now that maybe you've been in a little bit of a low place. 
Maybe you have had a moment where, you know, you haven't felt as though everything is working out in your life. I'm here to tell you this morning that because of the conditions that you're in, you are in a place where you're right on the edge of the miracle that you've been believing God to do in your life. And so we see this as Jesus is, is making his way through the ministry, as he's going with Peter on the boat, right? And we see this, that what's this, what is this miracle conditional on in Peter's life? As I began to think about it, I realized that, that so often we try to make things in Christianity and walking by faith about so many different things. But I discovered in this very simple story that, that the condition for Peter to experience his miracle was simple. It was conditional upon his obedience. Was Peter willing to just say yes to do what Jesus asked him to do? You know, sometimes we can complicate it and we can make it a lot of things. I'm not here this morning to tell you not to do your confessions and not to do all those things because, yes, I believe in all those things. But I think that so often where so many of us get stuck is that we sometimes can say yes with our mouth, but no with our actions, right? We so desperately want to do the thing that God is asking us to do. But when push comes to shove, what we've, we feel like I've already cleaned off of my nets, Jesus. You know, I've already tried that, Jesus. You know, I've already been down this road before, Jesus. And the result is, is that we know that we should be obedient, but our actions are contrary to what he's asking us to do. I'm here to tell you this morning that the miracles of God that you're waiting on in your life are simply conditional upon your obedience to follow what he's desiring to do in your life. And so as I read this, you know, in, in verse 2, right, we see this, that Jesus says this, that he was at the water's edge, he saw two boats that were left there by fishermen who were washing their nets. And he got into the one boat belonging to, to Peter and asked him to put it a little bit from the shore. And I begin to ask myself, you know, what was so special about Peter? Have you ever asked yourself that? I mean, I ask myself all the time because Peter gets a lot of airtime in the New Testament, right? I mean, he does a lot. Of, there was 12 disciples but you're constantly hearing about Peter. And I wanted to know what was so special about Peter because really when you read about Peter's character and the things that he did, you felt like, like you know, Peter was what? Like he was very impulsive, right? I mean, Peter was a know-it-all, right? I mean, like, how could you imagine being in the presence of Jesus and Jesus tells you something and you're like, no, no, Jesus, that could never happen, right? I mean, he was a know-it-all. Peter was, he was violent, right? I mean, how, let me tell you, you don't cut off somebody's ear, right? If you had a normal upbringing, okay? Like, Peter had a lot of things that weren't necessarily positive about his life. And, you know, I've heard people say, you know, it was that Peter was bold. And the more that I thought about it, I'm thinking, no, nah, because really his boldness, it got him into a lot more trouble than it got him into, you know, good situations. And so, you know, the more that I was thinking about this, I realized that I think the reason why Peter got picked, because you have to remember in this time where Jesus was, right, there was no YouTube, there wasn't Instagram, there wasn't Facebook, right? It wasn't easy to get the word out. And, you know, Jesus was all, he's got to get the word out, right? He only had three years of ministry. He's like, I got to get the word out, got to get the word out. I came to realize that I think that Peter got chosen simply because he had a boat, right? <laughs> I mean, like, Jesus knew that this, hey, this is how it's got to go. And so, you know, he walks out onto the beach, and literally, it's like the first boat that he saw. He goes, and he, like, hops onto the boat, right? And, and I think that that was the thing. And, and actually, let's take, let me talk about the part number two right now, is this point of understanding how the creator partners with his creation, yeah. okay? Because the, the thing that I thought was so amazing is this, and this is really kind of the main point that I want to drive home today, because I believe that, that sometimes what's the main hindrance, thank you, I'll take that, the main hindrance behind um, a lot of the times why we don't experience and see God manifest things in our life is that it's challenging for us to realize that God desires to use us to pour out his glory on the earth, Okay. And I think that this is a big thing that we have to understand is that, you know, the reason why we preach about, you know, financial prosperity and the reason we talk about, you know, being healthy and having good relationships is not, you know, because we're like, you know, the blab it and grab it because we're just so obsessed with having our life good. But I tell you something, I don't know about you, but when somebody is driving down the street in like a Toyota Corolla, right? Like no offense to Toyota Corolla. It's like, it's great. If you got a Toyota Corolla, that's amazing. But I'm not going to ask you what kind of car that you drive. 
okay? Or I'm not going to ask you what you do, but if somebody's driving down the street driving a Lamborghini, okay, my very first question that I want to ask them is, what is it that you do? You see, I believe that the reason why God desires that we, he would pour out his blessing on the earth today is, and through our lives, is so that our life would become attractive to the people that are in the world, And I think that sometimes our biggest challenge, the biggest thing that is so difficult to us is that we don't understand why God desires to do these things in our life. And we see that in this chapter is that, I mean, this is what I'm thinking about. So we said that, you know, Jesus needed Peter because Peter had a boat. But then I kind of reversed back to that and I realized, hang on a second, Jesus didn't need a boat because we read in Matthew chapter 14 that when there wasn't a boat to ride on, right? Like when the storm was so bad and Jesus is probably going to other fishermen saying, can you give me a ride across? And they're like, no, dude, like it's, look at the squalls out there. It's way too intense, bro. And so he can't, so what Jesus does at this point is he just, what, walks on the water. He doesn't actually need a boat. What Jesus does is he just speaks a word and changes the laws of buoyancy for a minute where maybe before you couldn't walk on water, but now all of a sudden things change. And so I saw this, and as I began to think about it, I realized this, that, that this wasn't how Jesus wanted to do his ministry. He could have walked on water, but he chose to take a ride on Peter's boat. I tell you, though, it's definitely not the way that I would have done it, right? Because, I mean, like, if Jesus was about to preach his first message, and, you know, he walks from the sand, and he walks on the water, right, and he's standing on the water preaching his message— you know, I mean, that is, that's a pretty good way to launch your ministry, right? It would be like me walking out here and all of a sudden I just start floating in midair and I just start preaching at you, right? I mean, it, it, I mean hey, it, it draws a crowd, okay? But Jesus didn't want to do it that way. He chose, right? He walks up to Peter and instead he desires to get into Peter's boat. Why? Because he wants to use us wants to use us. You know, I became so aware of the fact that Jesus could have just lived forever and done the whole work of salvation on his own. He could have, I mean, he didn't have to die. He chose to die. He could have, I mean, he could have lived forever. But what he desires, what, can I use your boat? Can I get in your boat? Can I use you to display the glory of God manifested here on the earth? And so I think that it's hard for us to understand why would the one who desire, who can walk on the water why would he want to use our boat? And I think that this is the main area where the devil, the devil is able to get in and creep in and begin to affect us through our thinking. You know, my boat's too small. You know, my boat's too dirty. You know, what could I do for Jesus? I think that's the main area. But even in the midst of that, even in the midst of the change, even in the midst of Peter's brokenness, even in the midst of all the problems, even in the midst of that, Jesus desired, can I use your boat? And I think that's where we sit here this morning, is that, Pete, that Jesus is desiring to, to reignite our desire. I, I believe the reason why he wants us to talk about this idea of reconnecting is that sometimes the disappointment of life, the hurts, the pains, the things that happen in our life, they can cause us to, you know, on the outside, you know, we we are connected, but on the inside, what we feel like my boat is, you know, my boat is too used. I feel like I let Jesus on my boat before, and it didn't turn out the way I thought it was supposed to. But I believe this morning in 2018, what God is doing is he's reigniting. He's rekindling a desire in us to be those people who he can use to bring the gospel to the world. And so because of this, I went from thinking that Jesus needing Peter's boat, and I realized this, that it wasn't that Jesus needed Peter's boat, but that Peter needed Jesus on his boat. Because what I realized was, is that when Peter was on his boat, it says he fished all night and caught nothing. And I think that sometimes this is where we feel like we are. We've tried and we've tried and we've tried and we've tried and we've 
produce nothing and the disappointment of life creeps up on us and things happen in situations and we find ourselves at like the, you know, like the Sea of Galilee at these low points in our life and it wasn't that Jesus needed Peter's boat but that Peter needed Jesus' blessing on his boat. We need to reconnect back to the source because as we reconnect back to the source, as we reignite our desire, as we step back into what God is asking us to do, as we allow his word to wash over our heart, as we allow this idea of who he is and what he says to become or to, to re-become our reality, what happens is, is his blessing, his glory begins to pour out of our life. And number three is this, that we're blessed by our connection. We're blessed by our connection. You see, the biggest problem that Peter had before Jesus was he had no fish. But one word from Jesus, his biggest problem became his breaking nets. One word from Jesus in our life can change absolutely everything. One moment with Jesus, one word with Jesus can change every situation in our life. You know, I want to make sure, I want to tell you this morning that if there's things that you're going through, if there's situations that are on your life, if there are things that you've been believing to change but you haven't seen them change, I'm believing this morning that there is an anointing here for Jesus to speak the word that you need in order to change the situation that you need to be changed. Because I tell you, all it takes is a word from Jesus. And you see this? We see in this story, we see that there's two groups, right? And, and actually in most places, most churches, we see also that there's really, that there's these two groups. And it, there's these two groups in this story is that there's the crowd and then there's the crew, right? Now, the crowd isn't bad at all. The crowd is good because, you know, thank Jesus that they're following him and they're experiencing the stuff and they're getting the word. But what I read in the story I realized was is that the crowd gets the message, but the crew gets the miracle. The crowd gets the message, but the crew gets a miracle. And I think that this is this exchange that Jesus has with Peter in this moment is Peter, is Jesus sees Peter on the shore and he looks at him and he says, Peter, I see you out there in the crowd. Will you come and be a part of my crew? I see you out there experiencing what I'm doing from afar, but will you choose to obey me, to submit to me, to follow me, to glean from me, and I'll make you a part of my crew. Because verse 7 says this, that, that we see immediately when Peter turns his will over to Jesus, when finally he lets go of the control, when finally he says, not my will, but yours be done, when finally he chooses not to err to, to human reasoning and he begins to think in the spirit, finally when he looks at Jesus and he says, I will allow your word in my life to be more powerful than my word in my life, we see verse 7 says this, that when they let down their nets, they caught such a huge catch like not just a little catch but it says that this catch was so much that they literally filled their whole boat and their boat was sinking yes. come on i don't think you're getting this because i tell you if if the beginning of a year tells me anything it's that there's new possibilities yes. you know maybe this morning you're sitting here and you feel like that situation you've been going after, that thing, that job, that relationship, that, those finances, those things, that idea. You know, sometimes what can happen to us is, you know, we've seen Jesus, you know, he's been preaching on the shore for a long time. We've heard the messages, we've heard the things. But I tell you something, there is something special this year. I mean, I'm telling my, my parents this, and I was actually telling Danielle this the other day, that there's been some things in my life and in my family's life that we've been believing God for a long time. And I, uh, I was talking to them about it, and I'm, you know, I'm just like stirred. I'm really stirred this year, I tell you. And I was talking to, I think it was Danielle that I was talking to first, and I was saying to her, you know, this reality that I'm feeling on the inside of me, it's, it's like, 
you know how there's, there's expectation? Like, if I knew that I had a new motorcycle coming, you know, which, you know, man, you know. But I know that it's like sh- getting shipped, you know. There's like an expectancy because I know that it's coming. But you know that moment, I don't know if you've ever gotten something new, but you know that moment when you've been waiting for something and waiting for something and waiting for something, and all of a sudden you hold it in your hand. It's like the expectation turns into something new, doesn't it? Like all of a sudden, all the expectancy and the anticipation changes into something different because now I'm holding it in my hands. That's the feeling that I have about this year. That everything that I had been waiting for, everything that I had been promised, those things that I felt as though could never possibly happen in my life, all the disappointment that's behind me, all the years that it didn't happen, all of a sudden I sit in this moment right here and I'm realizing, God, this is it. I don't know what it is, but it's like it went from expectation to ownership. Where I don't feel like I'm waiting any longer for when it's going to happen. I feel like I'm living in the middle of it. And this is the thing. That, let me tell you, God doesn't just want you blessed so that you could be blessed. Like we see a perspective of Jesus in the scripture where not only does Jesus bless Peter. Because he could have done that, right? And Peter would have been very thankful that Jesus let him onto his boat right? But we see the nature of God. He's a above and beyond. Yeah. He's a over the top. I mean, he's a God. I heard a preacher preach about this one time that he's a God of excess that, I mean, I don't think that God understands that like when enough is enough. I mean, like P- Jesus endangered Peter's life with how intensely he blessed Peter. I mean, he's so over the top. I think about that, like the bananas. Do you know how many bananas fall off the tree every single year and just rot on the ground. But you know what? God doesn't care. He's so far beyond our expectation that he desires to sink our boats with the blessing. But not just your boat. It says in the scripture that that once he had filled Peter's boat, Peter had to call over to his friends, call his friends over so that they could be a partaker of the blessing. I tell you, turn to your neighbor and say, you're so lucky that you're sitting beside me because I got the blessing of God flowing on my life. I tell you something, that's why I come to church. That's why I want to be a part of what God is doing because I want to be connected to the anointing. I want to be connected to the oil of God. So even if it's on you, I'm looking to get as much oil all over me because I want my blessing. I want your blessing. I want to be a partaker of what God is doing in your life. That's why I get around people because I understand what God is doing is so much beyond me. And so I see this, that everything that's connected to Jesus is blessed. Sometimes we feel like that, that it's such a difficult thing to do, you know, to let things go. You hear people say that all the time, you just give it to Jesus. I think that's probably the hardest thing that people ask you to do. You know, I know you're really believing for your spouse's salvation, but just give it to Jesus. You know, I know your house is about to foreclose, right? I know they're about to kick you out on the street, but just ah, give it to Jesus. You're like, you just need to shut up, right? I mean, like, <laughs> I don't need to give it to Jesus. I need Jesus to give it to me, right? I mean, <laughs> okay? But I realized in this story that everything that's connected to Jesus is blessed. Yeah. Everything connected, you know, the safest place for your promise is with Jesus. Sometimes those promises, those things that we hear from God, those are the things that we hold the tightest to. But I realized something, that Jesus wants the promise manifested in my life more, more than you do. He wants your spouse saved. He wants your children restored. He wants your business to succeed. He wants your life blessed more, more than you do. 
And I'm going to close with this. Verse 10 and 11 says this. And so James and John, the sons of Zebedee, were partners. And then Jesus said to him, don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish for people. So they pulled up their boats and left everything and followed him. I was talking to the Lord about this, and, and I heard the Lord ask me a question. He said, Alex, do you want the fish, or do you want to walk in the favor that comes from obeying Jesus? Because I tell you something, it's easy to hold on to what we have. You know, and preaching this message, and we're talking about faith, because, you know, I think that sometimes faith is the hardest thing, because, you know, if I was Peter, I would have said, you know, here's the deal, Jesus. You fill my boat, and then you could take a ride on it to go preach, right? Like, do the miracle for me, and then when I cast my nets, everything is going to be good, because I already know what you're going to do. And I think that sometimes the challenge of faith is that we have to first put out from the shore. We have to first let down our nets. We have to first step out and take a risk. And then in response, we see the miracle happen in our life. You know, it's easy to hold on to what we have. It's easy, you know, when the scripture says, you know, give and it shall be given. We like the it shall be given part, right? <laughs> Like, a friend must show himself friendly, right? I, I really want friends, but ooh, the risk of being friendly? Mm, don't know about that. But I realized something. Wait a minute. Am I more focused on the blessing? Or is my focus on the favor that comes from being obedient to Christ? Because I tell you, fish rot. Clothes, they go out of style really quick. But I tell you something, the favor of Jesus lasts. It lasts beyond the stuff. It lasts beyond the situations. The favor of Jesus goes before me. So I want to ask, can we just stand I believe there is a beautiful anointing in this place let me tell you you'll never miss the fish that you leave to follow God in faith I think about that you know when Peter was standing in you know Acts chapter 2 you know, he's standing out on the day of Pentecost, you know, and he's seeing revival happen and thousands of people are getting saved. I guarantee you, he never thought about the fish that he left on the shore. I guarantee you, he wasn't like, oh gosh, you know, Jesus, I see all the things that you're doing out here, but I really wish I had those fish. There's nothing that can take the place of our obedience. Heavenly Father, I'm thanking you right now for your word, the word, the word that we need. You know the word we need to break us through every situation. You know the word that we need to change everything that's around us. We don't want just a word, we want the word. We want your We don't need an expect explanation. We don't need justification. We just want your word. So Holy Spirit, I'm asking, as we take these next few moments, speak to us exactly what we need.
is a sure foundation for us in the midst of trouble. That when the winds blow and the waves come, when situations try to make us feel as though there is no hope, your word is our hope. You are our hope. We make a decision this morning to let you on our boat. Where we've been afraid, where we've been fearful. We let you on our boat. We want your word. We want your ways. We want to know you more. We want to follow you with all of our hearts. We know there is nothing better than living life with you. So like Jesus, we pray the prayer and say, Heavenly Father, not our will, not our desires, not our ways, not our plans, not our ideas, not our thoughts, not our motives, not our will, but yours. We'll go where you ask us to go. We'll do what you ask us to do. We'll say and be everything that you ask us to be. We ask you.